Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to look at another horrific situation with you. In February 2018, the tranquil town of Deltona, located in eastern Florida, near the Atlantic coast, was shaken by the horrible murder of a young man called Patrick De La Cerda. The 25-year-old guy was discovered dead in his house, and the severity of his injuries indicated that the offender harbored a particular grudge against him. The Patrick De La Cerda case is an example of a near, perfect, sophisticated, and premeditated crime that may have gone unsolved. Although the murderer was identified very immediately, there was no concrete proof to prove his guilt. As subsequently claimed investigator Chad Weaver, who studied the case, he knew from the start that it would be a real detective. Worthy of a cinematic adaptation, and so it was. Who is Patrick de la Curta? Patrick de la Cerda was born in June 1992 in Miami, one of Florida's most attractive cities. His father, Max de la Cerda, was a Spanish native, while his mother, Patricia Ronza, was born and raised in France before moving to the United States in the 1980s, where he married and had a son. The de la Curta family was very pleasant and cheerful. Patrick grew up in an environment of love, caring, and mutual respect. He was a really pleasant, clever, and social guy who did well in school, could quickly become the soul of any firm, and had a large number of friends. Furthermore, the youngster was very close to his parents from childhood, who made every effort and spent every penny to guarantee that his son obtained a decent education and grew up to be a respectable man. The family patriarch had spent his entire life working in the construction industry and was a highly skilled professional. The family was not wealthy, but they were well off by city standards. After graduating from high school, Patrick opted to pursue a career in construction to follow his father's legacy. When the young man was at university, his parents decided to divorce after nearly 25 years of marriage. It should be mentioned that they parted calmly and peacefully, with no scandals, property divisions, or other issues. The mother relocated to the tranquil hamlet of Deltona and states east and remarried shortly thereafter. The adult son elected to stay in Miami with his father where they worked together as respected and sought after construction professionals. Despite the divorce of the parents, all family members remained close and cordial to one another. They were always in touch with one another, calling and communicating on a regular basis and were always willing to help when needed. Patrick visited his mother in Deltona on a regular basis, telling her about all that was going on in his life, sharing his pleasures and experiences, and finally meeting the girl of his dreams. Because of his French, Spanish roots, the young man had a bright appearance and enjoyed great success with fair sex from an early age, but he has always been an example of the family in which he grew up. So Patrick did not seek frivolous and fleeting affairs, but rather a bright mutual feeling in fairs, but rather a bright mutual feeling, his own strong family. De La Cerda and the girl of his dreams met by chance on the internet, on one of the major dating sites where lonely hearts meet. He enrolled and created an account on the recommendation of a friend, but he did not really trust that he could meet his soulmate there. One June evening in 2017, he was scrolling through the profiles of females on the site with little enthusiasm when his eye was drawn to a photo of a fiery brunette with an unusually dazzling appearance. She had wide, unfathomable eyes and a lovely grin. Patrick was completely fascinated and decided to write to the stunning stranger. She responded to his message and they began to communicate more comfortably. The girl's name was Jessica Devnani. She was born in 1988 in Orlando, Florida, which is located in the state's central region. After graduating from high school, she enrolled in one of the local universities to study banking, and after graduation, she worked at a bank branch in her hometown of Orlando. Jessica was likewise immediately drawn to the beautiful young man. They exchanged phone numbers after a few days of active correspondence on the website. For the next few weeks, they contacted each other every evening and spoke for hours about everything. The couple immediately built mutual compassion and trust, and the young people decided to meet in person. However, because they resided in separate sections of the state, they decided to meet in a location roughly midway between them. Already on the first date, Patrick understood Jessica was the girl he had been waiting for and now refuses to let go. She 
also liked him right away, and Jessica was a little perplexed by the age difference because she was four years older than Patrick. On the way home, Patrick called his mother and informed her that he had met the girl of his dreams, whom he wanted to marry and establish a family with. Patricia recognized the thrill and excitement in her son's voice, knew he was serious, and was pleased for him. This long-distance romance lasted several months and posed a significant challenge because the pair could only visit each other on weekends, somewhere neutral. Typically, they leased a hotel room in some private location and simply enjoyed each other's company. However, everyone flew home on Sunday night because they had work the next morning. Marriage proposal in December 2017, Patrick relocated to Delton, where his mother lives, to be closer to his sweetheart. He purchased a house in a quiet neighborhood and began repairing it, creating a nice nest for his chosen one's move. However, Jessica was unable to leave work immediately, so they arranged a housewarming party for early spring of the following year. On the eve of the new year, which the couple celebrated together, the young man planned to surprise his fiance. He set off fireworks in the rear of the house, and while Jessica admired them, he dropped down on one knee and handed out a box with a ring, asking her the most crucial question. Will she become his lawful wife? Jessica was overjoyed and, naturally, agreed with him. Patrick revealed that he had been hunting for an engagement ring for a long time, but had not found the right one in any of the jewelry stores. He didn't think any of them were lovely or polished enough for the occasion. He chose the best of what was available so that he might make a proposal before the new year, but then bought another from the jewelry workshop and special ring designed by the young man himself, something had occurred to Patrick. Two months have passed since the engagement. Preparations for the wedding and approaching housewarming were underway. Their parents approved of the couple's decision, and they were overjoyed to be embarking on a new chapter in their lives. The young couple intended to host a magnificent celebration in Miami, on the Atlantic Ocean's coastlines, or in France, where the groom's mother was from. On February 27, 2018, Patrick's father, Max de la Sherda, received a call from a courier. The father's phone number was added as an additional contact. The courier reported that his son's order had been delivered to the specified address, but the customer did not open the door or answer the phone. This was unusual for Patrick, so the father became concerned, but because he was at work at the time and couldn't travel to pick up the order while also checking on his son's well-being. Max decided to consult his future daughter. In law, he contacted Jessica and, with anxiousness in his voice, stated that he could not reach his kid. Jessica had been attempting to contact her fiancé since the morning, but he did not return messages or calls. When she relayed this to Patrick's father, Max stated that something must have happened to Patrick. Jessica instantly dropped everything and dashed to the groom's house. When she pulled up, she saw Patrick's car in the driveway, indicating that he hadn't left. Jessica entered the yard with her own key and yelled out loudly to her beloved many times, but received no response. Jessica gingerly opened the front door and discovered a terrifying image. Her fiancé was lying near the entryway in a pool of his own blood. He showed no evidence of life. Jessica immediately called 911. But when paramedics arrived, they were unable to rescue Patrick and proclaimed him dead. When the cops came, Jessica was sobbing in the backyard of the house where Patrick had proposed two months prior. When one of the officers approached her, she simply looked at him and informed him she knew who had murdered. And had loved and destroyed her entire life, a wealthy and powerful ex-boyfriend, to comprehend this tough case and who could want to kill a young man who, at first look, had no enemies or ill-wishers. You must go back a little bit to when he and Jessica first met. The girl was then in a relationship with Gregory Bender, a wealthy businessman who ran his own investment fund. Jessica first met Gregory when she was a student. He was 20 years her senior, and he literally turned the young beauty's head. The businessman wooed her beautifully, gave her expensive gifts, and brought her to luxurious resorts. Jessica thought she had discovered her true love, but she soon noticed some peculiarities in his conduct. Gregory strove to exert control over his fiancée in all aspects of her life, keeping careful tabs on where she went and who she communicated with. If Jessica had an admirer, he quickly got rid of him with threats and intimidation. At the same time, he told her very little about himself. 
This romance lasted over eight years, during which time Gregory never presented his chosen one to his family or acquaintances. Gregory rarely asked his girlfriend to his place, and they only met, spent time together, or went on vacation when he wanted to. He maintained that he was really busy. Naturally, Jessica wanted to have a normal family and children, but Bender insisted that it was not yet time, and when she attempted to stop the relationship, Gregory gave her a ring and asked her to marry him. Jessica agreed, but nothing had changed. They continued to live separately and only. Saw one other when the groom said so. Gregory was into a car accident and ended up in a hospital bed. Jessica went to him when she heard about it, but first she stopped by his house to collect some supplies for Gregory. Jessica encountered a woman she had never seen before and inquired as to her identity. Rather than responding, the stranger asked her a similar question. Jessica showed the ring on her finger and announced that she was the bride of the house's owner. The woman then smiled and presented her ring, claiming to be Bender's lawful wife, Demora Sanchez Bender. After such a terrible revelation, Jessica resolved to immediately end her relationship with the businessman who had cheated her for so long. However, the boyfriend began to literally chase Jessica, imploring her to return and vowing to divorce Demora in the near future so that they could marry. She once again believed this man, but as time passed, nothing in their relationship changed. Jessica became tired of this affair and filled out a form on a dating site where she met Patrick. After beginning to speak with him, she made the solid decision to end her relationship with Gregory, which she notified him of, but he refused to let go. Obsessive stalker initially, Bender merely persuaded Jessica to return to him and try to start over, promising to divorce his wife. Then he moved on to threats and harassment. And when he saw that all of this was pointless, he decided to look for a rival about whom he knew nothing. He had to hire pros to hack into Jessica's account and see who she was chatting with. Gregory began sending Patrick threatening texts and demanding that he break up with Jessica, whom he referred to as his fiance, after discovering his identity and acquiring his contact information. Patrick did not react to the threats and remained calm, believing that the situation would not escalate beyond threats. But Jessica was terrified because she realized her ex-boyfriend could expect anything from her. He was a wealthy and well-connected man with an extensive collection of weaponry at his disposal. Jessica offered Patrick to end their relationship before anyone was hurt, but he refused. Then they decided to contact the police, providing evidence that Bender was stalking and threatening them. The couple obtained a restraining order against Gregory, preventing him from approaching them or attempting to make contact in any way. Gregory was also ordered to forfeit all firearms held in his residence. Things settled down for a while, and the couple began to believe that the stalker had left them alone. Jessica, on the other hand, persuaded Patrick that it was important to install ketchup cameras outside and within the house because she was concerned that Gregory might breach the restriction. A crime scene investigation, and the first theory, but let's return to the awful events of February 27, 2018. During the initial examination of the crime scene, criminalists instantly ruled out the robbery theory and remarked that, based on the extent of the mutilation, this murder had a personal motive and the murderer genuinely despised his victim. A 25-year-old man was found with four gunshot wounds in his leg, chest, and head. The experts also discovered cuts and bruises consistent with a fall from a ladder. The body itself was lying on the floor between the front entrance and the stairs to the second story. Investigators suspected that the killer had crept into the house and was waiting for the owner on the second floor. When Patrick walked inside and climbed the stairs, the intruder stepped out to confront him and fired the first bullet into his leg. The wounded young guy rolled down the stairs and the offender followed him down, firing another bullet into his chest before killing the victim with two follow-up shots to the head. The murder weapon was not discovered. However, it was a relatively uncommon model of pistol that was difficult to purchase. The first shell casing was discovered on the second story of the house. Two more comparable shell casings were discovered downstairs, but the fourth was not present, implying that the offender took it with him, possibly as a prize. Despite Jessica's claims that she knew who killed her fiance, the first person suspected was the slain man's neighbor with whom he had a significant disagreement a few months prior. The man was a war combatant and a veteran of the United States. Army, 
was injured and severely concussed during the conflict, which caused him to suffer a mental condition. He was an expert with firearms and could easily get a rare model of rifle. In December 2017, the veteran opened fire on his new neighbor, mistaking him for a burglar. Fortunately, no one was wounded, but the neighbor was admitted to a psychiatric hospital owing to an aggravation of his condition. After he got home, he continued to pursue Patrick, calling him a spy and promising to expose him. The mentally ill neighbor may have a motive based on his unstable imagination. Therefore, the man was imprisoned and chose to question. He made no secret of his disdain for Patrick, but at the time of the murder, he had a complete alibi, which was corroborated by multiple witnesses who were looking for evidence and trying to provoke the culprit. So, the original version of the heist was canceled because everything in the house was in its proper position and the money and valuables remained unharmed. Only hard disks with recordings produced by video surveillance cameras were gone, making it impossible to determine who entered and exited the property that day. In addition, no evidence was discovered at the crime scene. Forensic scientists were unable to locate a single fingerprint, shoe print, or DNA trace. The murder was well organized, and while the investigation had little question that Gregory was responsible, it appeared at the time that he would get away with it. The cops decided to go undercover and requested Jessica to call her former lover and invite him to a candid talk. Jessica agreed without hesitation. She called Bender and made a spectacle of herself. She blamed him for what had happened, cried, and continued asking why he'd done it. But Gregory appeared to have worked out what the investigators were up to from the start and insisted on pretending he didn't understand. When Jessica revealed that he had slain her fiancé, the businessman feigned to be astonished and later conveyed his sorrow to the ex-girlfriend. Getting Gregory to confess, making him angry, or forcing him to make a mistake never worked. The police had no reason to hold or question the man. He could only be asked to testify, but he followed the restraining order and appeared to have let the ex-girlfriend go a long time ago. The killer's notes while the inquiry was treading water, looking for any leads. Demora Sanchez Bender called and said she had significant information concerning the Patrick de la Cerda case. The wife was immediately invited to the station for an interview, during which she stated that just before the incident, she noticed a peculiar notebook on her husband's desk in his office. Demora investigated and discovered a precise design of some stranger's house, along with a bizarre algorithm of activities. She hadn't paid attention to it at the time, but when Demora saw a news report about a young man's brutal murder and the story showed the layout of his house, she remembered the sketches of her unfaithful husband, with whom she was on the verge of divorce and decided to inform the investigators. This information provided the authorities with adequate justification to search the alleged perpetrator's home. The unusual notebook mentioned by the businessman's wife was recovered in the office, but the pages containing the house plan and other information had been deleted. However, they were quickly discovered in the workplace, but in a garbage can that Gregory had obviously neglected or forgotten to empty. He simply took out the pages, crumpled them, and threw them away. Apparently, he was convinced that his home would not be investigated because there was no proof against him. In addition to the house layout, the sheets of paper contained a comprehensive blueprint of the crime itself. It became evident that the offender had spent a significant amount of time and effort planning every detail. It was specifically mentioned that the phone should be turned off, gloves should be worn, and the soles of shoes should be lubricated with a special substance so that no traces would remain on the floor. The records revealed that Gregory tracked his victim, knew when Patrick arrived home, and was aware of the presence of surveillance cameras in the house and yard. In addition, Gregory disposed of the criminal weapon, unclean clothes, shoes, and gloves. The fact that his own documents had not been erased in time, as well as his wife's interest, disappointed him. In addition, a fourth missing round casing was discovered on the table inside a cigar box that the gunman was supposed to have taken as a prize. Forensics determined that it was the same shell casing from the crime site. Despite the defense attorney's attempts to shift the blame to Jessica, the evidence was sufficient to arrest Gregory and begin the trial. But the fundamental issue was that all of the evidence revealed could be considered circumstantial because the crime weapon was never discovered. There was no indication that the accused had ever visited the victim's home.
and there were no witnesses. Bender's trial did not commence until May 2020, one more than three years after the atrocity. During this period, he engaged the best lawyers who had time to fully prepare for the case. The businessmen appeared to be enthusiastic and confident that he would get away with it. Jessica was an important witness. She revealed her long-term relationship with Gregory, including how she discovered he was married and attempted to end it, as well as the harassment and threats he made against her and Patrick. She provided evidence in the form of saved screenshots of communication and phone records. In response, Bender's attorneys attempted to transfer all of the blame to Jessica. The defense claimed that Jessica triggered Gregory's behavior by registering on a dating site and beginning a new connection while Gregory was still in a relationship with her, which injured his dignity and ego. Jessica was also accused of mercantilism, with some claiming that she enjoyed receiving expensive gifts from wealthy suitors. The key evidence, sheets, containing records of the murder plot were described by the lawyers as the fantasy of a wounded man seeking vengeance on his competitor. At the same time, the defense claimed that the defendant's involvement in the crime was limited to planning and dreams. Hence, no traces of him were discovered. Furthermore, the lawyers claimed that the search of their client's home was illegal and violated, and that the second piece of evidence, a shell casing, could have been planted during the procedure. The crime weapon was also not discovered, and Jessica identified the model of the gun from a photograph, claiming that she had previously seen it in her boyfriend's collection. But she could be mistaken, as she was unfamiliar with weaponry. Ex-wife testimony and final verdict. Dimora Sanchez, the defendant's now ex-wife, testified at one of the sessions. The man, who had before appeared disinterested, suddenly got enthusiastic and declared his love for her. The ex-wife was affected by this confession and appears to have changed her mind about testifying against Gregory. She erred in her evidence, alleging forgetfulness, and finally stated that she lived with the man for many years and doubted his ability to commit murder. Despite defense counsel attempts to contest the validity of the defendant's home search, his ex-wife's unexpected confession, and a lack of direct evidence, the jury convicted Gregory Bender guilty of first-degree murder after hours of deliberation. He received a life sentence and will never be eligible for release. As the judge read the sentence, the defendant stared at Jessica, seemingly without blinking. He was actually gazing at her, making her feel ill and nearly panicked. She sat next to her late fiancé's mother and broke down in tears, literally choking. Despite several attempts by Bender and his well-paid lawyers to challenge the conviction and have it reviewed, all of their pleas were denied. Not the least role in this was the case's widespread resonance in society, as a wealthy millionaire businessman murdered a simple working guy in cold blood and attempted to get away with it. Patrick Delacarta's story received extensive press coverage. With Gregory Bender still in prison, Jessica Devnani says she feels safe and will continue to live for Patrick and honor his memory. She wears the ring he gave her as a gift, as well as the special piece of jewelry Patrick never got around to gifting her. Jessica has a tight relationship with her deceased fiancé's parents, who regard her like their own daughter 